<laughs> Jan Ross will give an explanation of the previous talk. <laughs> Title, and we'll see how that relates to the books. Actually, it does interrupt C60 a little bit. Right. Uh -huh. let's say atomic physics, Rydberg physics or whatever to, to the now you know topical stuff like ultra fast, ultra intense. And I was thinking now oh, what, what do I have to offer which is <laughs> relates to my history in atomic <laughs> physics and maybe it's not totally boring. And then I came up with like threshold physics. I love threshold physics as you know. So ionization goes to threshold and there happened to be a very recent result in Nora Beras group by basically do single photo ionization of C60 minus, like ending up removing two or three electrons. And that I think is very intriguing, and I would like to challenge you with the back on the envelope explanation of what you've seen, and I hope you can disprove my result by doing after second measurements on that process, by really figuring out how it works. But I'll come to that in a second. So, since I will probably run out of time in the end, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators in the beginning. <laughs> and that's of course always Ulf Salman, who has been instrumental for many years in the cluster business in my department. And right now, the guys were sweating a lot to get their PhD up here, Francesco, Abraham, and recently Werder joined us. And Christian, Alexei, and Yunus got their PhD already, and I'm talking a little bit about their results, which were obtained in the past. Most of you know them. Yeah, so um, fast electron dynamics in extended systems under short intense light pulses. Why, why could that be interesting? Of course, uh, we have these novel light sources and they deliver unprecedented high spatial energy density in short pulses. We know that. I mean, this is kind of a blessing and a curse at the same time because you get lots of statistics and you destroy everything, as we know. So if you have a solid sample, and this is devastating because it takes forever to bring another solid sample into the beam, and the cluster is a very good compromise because it has essentially the density of a solid sample, but you can deliver in a beam a new one all the time, so many times during basically hours to get high statistics. So therefore I think clusters are an ideal probe to really combine this high spatial energy density with yeah, matter of, of condensed density. And uh, uh, the deposit, of course, allow a large amount of photon energy into the system. That's what we want, and we see how this is distributed, how it works. Eventually, also to learn how we can do that without too much damage in order to be able eventually to image the system at the same time before it actually goes uh, yeah, broke. And what I find actually more interesting in the context of uh, very fast dynamics, and I think the development has been so quick that by now the x-rays are actually shorter, almost shorter than the other second pulses. At least for double pulses they are available now and they are available with like, uh, we heard that I think in previous talks, almost one to two femtosecond pulse duration in each pulse and the separation, whatever you want, between a couple of femtoseconds up to 100. So that's ideal for pump probe. And uh, the question comes up again, what can you actually learn from these very short pump probe Pulses. And I think it is more obvious and more, how to say, intuitive for the x-rays that you actually will have dissipative processes and eventually even incoherent dynamics. And my quest has always been the interesting part, what you can learn from time-dependent dynamics in the ultrafast, are dissipative and incoherent processes. Because there, after a very short time, the dynamics is over. But if the dynamics is coherent, 
then you actually do a Fourier transform, and as long as you can measure everything, you get an equivalent information in the energy domain. So this is not so interesting in a sense, very small systems which are coherent, you can maybe more elegantly observe in the time domain, but essentially you don't get more information out. Where it really makes a difference if you have a large system which has very fast dynamics and which is intrinsically dissipative and incoherent. And most large systems are that because we cannot measure everything and simply part of the system is gone and the interesting physics is over maybe after a couple of times of seconds. And there, these time dependent probes we have now are really make a difference, I think, in the future. And of course, what's nice is if you pump a lot of energy into the system, you can treat it at least after it's pumped in the energy, and we always kind of keep secretly uh, our ways how to pump energy into the system, but the subsequent dynamics is almost classical. Yeah? And the guys who have known me for a while know that I love to do classical mechanics for quantum systems, and that's the right way to apply that here. And of course, we're after new phenomena. And I said in the beginning, you know, an attribute to, to Brad, I want to discuss <laughs> a much more gentle process, single photon multiple ionization near threshold. And there, the interesting fact or question is how is the small photon energy transferred to several electrons? And what turned out essentially as a result of this experiment, this was not planned, that the very good way to do that is to compare basically the negative ion with the neutral species for the same number of electrons removed. Because the negative ion has a very, very loosely bound electron with very small energy, and this is kind of a very good spy for what's going on with the dynamics in comparison to the neutral. And this is what I would like to illustrate to you now in the first couple of minutes. So multiple electron removal in C60 and C60 minus near threshold with UV photons. How the hell does this work with UV photons near threshold? Well, the reason is very simple. Um, <coughs> essentially, the, this is the process. So you have your C60 shell, you come in with a photon, and you get a photoelectron, right? And this goes somewhere, kicks out another electron, goes somewhere else, next electron is out, and let's say in the end, the photoelectron and the last electron leave. So this is roughly the process. Of course, the big question is, where actually does the photoelectron go? Does it go there? Does it go, where does it go? Is there a systematics behind it? And I try to convince you that with a little bit of thinking, without any calculation, one can figure out where these electrons go, for two and three electrons. <coughs> okay, and in C60 minus, and that's a nice point now, you have this additional valence electron which is kind of diffuse or which is kind of on the outside somewhere. And this photoionization dynamics is not affecting the valence electron, right? Because the dipole is coupling, of course, to the more tightly bound electron. So essentially, this extra electron is a spectator electron, which will tell us in comparison to C60 what's going on. Okay, and the spectator electron has a double role, and you'll see that in a minute. This is already the result, the experimental spectrum. So what you see here is, as a function of the photon energy, very standard photoelectron spectrum, kind of the well-known original one for the neutral C60 going uh, to C60 double plus in green. And the same thing for the neutral going to a triple plus, so three electron removal <coughs> also in green. And then red is the new experimental results from Dora's group, and this is here shown in red. And what you see, of course, is it looks a little bit different. Actually, look very different, and this was not known at all because these guys, this is uh, Albert's uh, team, they gave their results only on a log-log plot. So nobody came actually to the idea that this could be similar, but it's identical. I will show you if you stretch it the right way. <laughs> and the second difference really is here that, of course, you have a shift in the threshold, and this is simply. Uh, what the spectator electron also does to you. But the interesting part is the shift is by far not as big as you would expect because you're really attacking the same electron with your photon. It's not the loosely bound valence electron. I mean, the true threshold is somewhere here, but the yield is vanishingly small. So this is called the appearance threshold where really the dipole response kicks in. Okay, so now what does the spectator electron do? We simply, it scales essentially the x the energy axis. So if you stretch the energy axis the right way, and if you shift it by this appearance threshold difference, you get out this result. So essentially this is kind of identical for the negative ion and the neutral one after scaling. And here, so this is the theoretically predicted scaling 
and it agrees totally with the free fit. In this case, the free fit would produce this one, and the predicted scaling would produce this one. So there's a bit of a freedom uh, in, in the experimental scaling, which is not so easy because they have to subtract their, their threshold. They don't know where the zero is. That's really not that easy. But anyways, I think you see it's kind of really remarkably similar. So this actually gives you, of course, a reason to think about it and maybe to think about the role of the spectator electron more closely. And essentially what this does, going from here to here, is a linear transformation of the energy axis, so a scaling, essentially a stretching of the negative ion spectrum, and of course the shift of the threshold. In these two parameters, I can now calculate analytically in like two lines. But it takes like an hour to explain that. It took me a long time to figure it out. <laughs> so here is the process. First, the scaling factor. The scaling factor is relatively simple. We did that before for helium, comparing photoionization of helium with electron impact ionization of helium plus. There you have a similar phenomenon. So what you need to do is, of course, you need to consider the process I sketched for you in the beginning, the photoelectron. Uh, is created by absorbing the photon and it subsequently knocks out additional, no, photons, sorry, electrons. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you'd expect, And the energy scale is given by instantaneous binding energy, so it makes sense to define a dimensionless energy axis, which is given by the actual photon energy divided by this energy scale. Now, what is the energy scale for the removal of two electrons? Oops. Uh, we know that the binding energy for the valence electron to be knocked out is 7.61 eV. This is the HOMO, if you wish, because the photon has been going to HOMO minus 1 because of dipole selection. Yeah, it's, it's large dipole matrix element. So essentially, uh, this would be then our scaling for the neutral. And now in the negative ion, we have a choice. We have the valence electron, which is screening. Uh, sorry, the negatively bound electron here was 2.66 eV binding and the normal valence electron. And basically the average binding for screening is just half of it, we can say. And therefore, this is the scaling for the negative ion. And if you want to match now the energy scale of the negative ion to the neutral, you have to take, of course, the ratio as the stretching factor of beta. And this one, U1.48, this is what I showed to you here. That's exactly done here, it's 1.5. And the same thing is now for 1.32. I will show you in a minute for three electrons how does this work. Very similarly. So now for the pair to be knocked off by the photoelectron, you need 19 eV in the neutral. And in the negative ion, again, you have additionally available your spectator electron. So you need two thirds of that. This is wrong. So sorry. It's early. But the ratio is correct. It gives you 1.32 in the end. Here basically divide that by this one. So this is the first part, and now for the second part for the threshold shift, this is a bit more tricky, and you might not follow me in that one, but it's a proposal. Okay, <laughs> so in the negative ion we know, of course, electrons get easier out because the spectator electron screens the positive charge. That's, that's a fact, that's simply true, and this is also reflected by the special energies. The process we have looked at already is photoionization followed by sequential electron impact ionization. And the only question is, you know, can I determine just by thinking where on the, on the shell of, of the hull of the C60, which ion is actually hit by photoelectron? And this would then give me information about the threshold shift. So let's, let's think about it. Yeah? So we have first this ionization, which happens somewhere. The photoelectron is created. And uh, at the last ionic site of the ionization, there is an electron created. Of course, because at the last site, the photoelectron and the kicked out electron leave both of them. And both of them have very little energy, because it's near threshold and all the energy is used up. So the last pair leaves really slowly. And that means at this site, so here you have a positive one, but at the last side, this is just two electron removal, you have actually a negative charge. Yeah? This is your ion, you have a photoelectron which is now slow, and the electron you kick out. So this is effectively negatively charged side, and you have the initial side where the photoelectron was created, and that means you have here now a Coulomb attraction yeah? in the neutral. You have a Coulomb attraction, 
So these two electrons have it a bit harder to leave in the neutral because they are attracted by the initial positive side. Question is, what is this distance? Now we can think about it, what this distance is. And essentially, before I do that, I should tell you why I do all this. That is, now if you go <coughs> to, the, sorry, to the negative ion, then we have our, our spectator electron around. And the spectator electron, what will it do? It will screen our initial positive ion, right? So this makes it neutral, and that cancels this attraction. And that's why it's easier to get out for the electrons in the negatively charged ion. So that means the energy difference, which relates to the threshold shift between the negative ion and the neutral is exactly this Coulomb repulsion here. And now the question is, where does it happen? And this is very easy, because if you think just uh, statistically, where are the most ions available for the photoelectron once it's been generated somewhere here is of course on the equator. Yeah? There's the most ions sitting on the shell, on the sphere. And therefore this distance is simply the square root of two of, of the radius of C60. And if you do that with the valence radius of C60 given by 9.75 UV, you get the result. I'll show you later. It gives you exactly the shift which has been measured experimentally for the threshold. So that's two electron removal. Three electron removal is totally different, which is a bit hard. This took me really a while to come up with that one. So for three electron removal, we have this intermediate state that you have the photoelectron, and this makes an impact ionization on, the, on some other side, wherever it is, before it comes to the final knockout, another impact ionization, if you wish. Now we, want, we know for impact ionization, the most probable angle is zero degrees, just forward scattering. Now we have to think which geometry, which site basically on the C60 shell, which ion site does allow you to fulfill that most closely that you could do forward scattering. That's the next neighbor. Wherever you go to some other site, the angle will be more sharp here between this one and this one. Yeah? So it's really the next neighbor which does that. And the next neighbor has, of course, the average carbon carbon distance. And essentially, this is an almost double this distance. So here, the decisive Coulomb attraction which happens between the first and last side is now twice the uh, basically carbon carbon distance. That's 2.73 atomic units and if you do that and find out you get roughly five electron volts in three electron removal and for this case you get two electron volts and this is what they came up experimentally with. So this is really extremely close. And the scaling I showed you, this was also working fine. So this you can now believe, and if you don't believe it, please measure it, how it really works. It would be fantastic. <laughs> okay, so, so much for that, so much for the history and, you know, basically reminiscence. But I think what, what can be taken home is a message, message that really spectator electrons in a negative ion can probe mechanisms of multiple electron removal by single photon near threshold. I think this is a general notion which we kind of discovered by chance, because this loosely bound negative electron is a very, very sensitive probe for the dynamics which is brought on there. All right, so I wasted a lot of time, and I will respond now come to many photons quickly delivered in the X-ray uh, pulse. And I want to discuss with you two nice phenomena. One is the granularity peak in ionic Coulomb explosion. And the next one is then an experiment at LCLS. And this leads to proton segregation, X-ray plus Coulomb explosion of molecular clusters, um, more precisely in hybrid clusters. And that ties very nicely in with what uh, Artem was talking about and also Kiyoshi in the molecule, essentially that the protons go out very fast. So the phenomenon is really related to that, what's been seen there. So this is maybe a short notion for also the younger people in the audience, if there are some there. <laughs> <laughs> the students among you, that really a multi-photon absorption in infrared is very, very different from multi-photon absorption in the X-ray. Why is that? Because of the dipole matrix elements, once again. Multi-absorption in the infrared, this is maybe the typical example. You've seen that one electron absorbs a couple of infrared photons. That's multi-photon absorption, yeah? And maybe gets out for ionization or something like that. Now, for X-rays, this is not possible because with a single photon, you're already high up in the continuum, and there the dipole coupling with the next photon is negligibly small. 
So that means the next photon actually attacks another well-bound electron in your big sample, and you have many, many almost equivalent single, ion, single photoionization events. So that means you can zap up your whole system almost simultaneously within one femtosecond by ionizing, I don't know, 100 electrons. That's quite spectacular. So you can ask yourself what happens if you do that. And we know, of course, and discussed in the past quite a few phenomena which are obvious, which also relate to other violent processes in extended systems, nanoplasma formation that was mentioned already, field ionization, charge vibration, <coughs> and also, especially in this case, you get electron interaction in the continuum. So these 100 electrons, they kind of correlate and interact before they go out. This has very interesting consequences. I won't have time today to discuss about that, but I want to discuss basically the complement to that, and this is what happens with the ions, because of course you have also generated in less than a half a second or something like that, a hundred positive ions sitting there. So they should also have correlated Coulomb explosion somehow, or some phenomenon. And this is what I want to discuss. And there's an interesting now effect, and this has to do with the fact that these are really ions, that's not a gelium, that's not a plasma. And people like to simulate that, at least for large systems, as a continuum density, positive density, but this does not give the right result if you have a finite system with a boundary. This is basically what all our systems are, they are finite. And I will explain you to that, I'll explain you that in a second. And then I said uh, this application for um, these hybrid clusters at LCS <coughs> pulses, where you have an intricate interplay between the electron and the ion dynamics. So let's look at this granularity peak, the extreme ionic Coulomb explosion. So assume that from each atom in the cluster, one electron has been removed. That's what I just said, yeah? By intense X-rays, many photons remove one electron from each atom in the cluster. And now we have, all of a sudden, all these ions sitting there. And this is a well-known result from continuum plasma theory. It predicts that these electrons, if they are removed slowly by a long pulse, <coughs> then a shock wave forms. This is simply because essentially you have already repulsion of these ions in the inner part, but there are some neutrals still on the outside still to be ionized, so the inner ones overtake the outer ones, and that gives you a shock wave of the ions exploding. Now, if you do that very fast, that means all the ions are available almost at once, then this mean field theory tells you that there's a characteristic square of kinetic energy dependence of the spectrum, the ionic spectrum. This you can derive relatively easily. Question is now, is this really true for a realistic system which contains a finite but large number of ions? And of course it's not true, I'm not <coughs> telling you that. So the real situation is this one and not this one. And the answer is actually a little bit more complicated. It is true in certain limits, and it really depends, like always in physics, on a relative ratio. Yeah? You have to say, basically, what does granularity mean? I mean, what does it mean that there's empty space in between these ions? What is this length of the empty space compared to what? And compared to what is actually the thickness of the edge. This is where the ion density decays to zero. What's this width? Yeah? This you have to compare to basically the density of your ions, and this tells you if you have kind of a continuum system, or you have really an effect of this uh, granularity of the fact that you have uh, different ions. And here you see that. Now, illustrated, if you have basically now a short pulse, this is this uh, plasma theory, and you have complete ionization before Coulomb explosion starts. Yeah? That means you have a kind of a here box-like ion density, very sharp, you have monotonically increasing force, and your spectrum would evolve something like that. So you have Coulomb explosion, and this is now the square of E energy spectrum, which you can calculate very easily from the density. Now, on the contrary, if you have, you would have a long pulse, then the Coulomb explosion starts before ionization is finished. You have the more long, longer this box uh, density, but it's kind of a soft density decreasing of the ions radially, and this gives rise to a non-monotonic force and you get this shock wave, because the inner ones you know, overtake the outer ones. That was kind of proposed or predicted in 2003. So, and this is what really happens. So this is uh, N ions, which suddenly <coughs> explode, N is 1,000, and then a Jones type of cluster, where you ionize it 
basically ideally uh, at a time. And then you see you get this orange kind of shaped energy spectrum for the ions. This scale is the maximum energy you would expect from the mean field here. So this is the mean field result, the square root of E. And of course it looks like a shock wave, but it shouldn't. Yeah? It should not whatsoever because it's very fast. It's not slowly. So what is going on here? That's of course the question. And this is what I do not put into context for you here, but it's for people who do DFT and so on. It's very interesting. You can actually kind of simulate this effect with a mean field theory uh, amended by correlation hole um, around each uh, of the ions. Then you get already this kind of uh, black spectrum here. It's not a plot. Anyway, so we do it the real way and want to understand what's going on. And that's now an overview of what is really going on. What's plotted here is now lots of these spectra I just showed you, where here the pulse length is varied, and here you see the energy spectrum. Yeah? And the shock wave is here for long pulses, and here's this new phenomenon, what I just showed you with the orange spectrum for very short pulses. And that's really different. It's a totally different phenomenon. It's characterized by different dynamics, and it kind of gives here uh, turnover between this and this one. And of course there's a scale to make it universal. The scale is here simply uh, the time it takes to double a Coulomb explosion the size of your system. And this is the energy we had already, the maximum energy which can be obtained. Now how is this different? This is our shockwave, you know it, and this is the granularity peak. And the difference is really where this comes from is that in the granularity peak, what you have is essentially at the edge now, you don't have the sharp distribution. You have basically a missing part on the outside and here an additional part on the inside. And that basically kind of puts your ions together close to the surface. Yeah? And this happens right away because right away you create some ions also on the surface. And this is now the difference in these two phenomena. The shock wave takes time to develop because the inner ones need to take over the outer ones, while this granularity peak basically emerges right from the beginning, once you start to have ionization. And this is the signature, again, an ultra-fast signature, which eventually you want to measure. So this is here the time dependence. You see the shock wave in relative time happens relatively late, but the granularity peak develops right from the beginning. So this is this spectrum here, and that's the real time dependence, and this is this spectrum here, it's real time dependence right from the beginning. And that's really the difference in the signature of these two phenomena. Okay, and how can you rationalize that? Of course, you could say that's a structural property. You can model that by the sharpness of your ion distribution. You can do that, for instance, if you model your ion distribution by a Fermi distribution with a short, certain edge width R. And then you get this one here. And this can simulate simply by changing the pulse length of excitation, right? If you make the pulse length long, then you get the limit for the shock wave appears, you have a soft edge. If your pulse length is very short, you have basically a very sharp edge, and this is this picture I had in the beginning. So essentially, ultra-fast techniques allows you really to investigate or simulate structural properties here of such a finite system. All right, so that was the first part of the ultra-fast. You can read that here was too fast. And uh, the second part is now this proton segregation X-ray induced Coulomb explosion of molecular clusters. And that's again kind of the result already. So this is methane clusters, thousand uh, uh, molecules in the cluster that are 1 keV 10 femtosecond X-ray pulses from LCLS. And here you see different intensities. And this is basically the abundance of charge of the heavy Ion, that means the carbon in a pristine carbon cluster of 689 atoms and here in this methane cluster, 689 molecules. And you see, if you have relatively low intensity, there's not so much difference between the pristine and the uh, molecular cluster. If you have very high intensity, then it's also not so much difference. But at a certain intermediate intensity, there's actually a huge difference. You have almost no charging of carbon in the methane cluster, but you have, of course, lots of charge states, also higher charge states in the pristine carbon cluster. That's what you would expect because you couple your energy, your photons, into the carbon 1s at 1 kV. So you remove all the electrons from the carbon 1s, but for some magic region in this energy range, uh, all the carbons stay neutral or get neutralized. 
which does not happen here and also not so much here in the low intensity regime. And now sometimes the experimental colleagues get really lucky because the intensity in LCLS which was available is exactly this one. <laughs> so they didn't know about this or that. Of course not, because it could not be really during the beam time. But this is more or less, I think, what's seen by Todd Dittmeyer and colleagues. He really saw almost only neutral carbons coming out. And this is what triggered us to investigate that. Because this is crazy, it's really amazing. So what's behind that? Here is now the electron ion dynamics in the simulation that you see here as a function of real time, if you wish. This is the pulse length, yeah, 20 femtoseconds, or 10 femtoseconds, sorry. Um, you see here the charging of the cluster. This is the pristine one again, a bit smaller one, so it goes faster. And it's just charging up. Basically, one uh, electron is removed more or less at this intensity per, uh, per atom. And now we see in the molecular one, it's also charging up, but then it gets neutralized again. Yeah? And this is exactly what we saw. Of course, this has a, a profound effect on the radius. Essentially, this uh, methane cluster stays together. Yeah? So the carbons here don't move, almost don't move apart, not even in 70 femtoseconds. While, of course, in the pristine one, they get Coulomb exploded, and of course, here, the protons go away. That's the trick, right? The protons take all the shit, if you wish. They take the energy, they take the charge, they take all the dirt you put in with your photons, which is very, very desirable, because you're not interested in the protons, you're interested in the heavy atoms for imaging and so on, for molecular backbones. And a very nice uh, effect also on the electronic part is that because of that, because the protons take away everything, the electron plasma stays very cool. Yeah? This is kind of the kinetic energy of the trapped electrons, so the temperature, if you wish, of the electron plasma in the pure carbon cluster, relatively high, but here this remains really, really cold, which again is very good news because it doesn't do too much damage. Yeah, so the ions don't move, the trapped electrons stay cool, more protons must carry away the energy, and this is what's shown here now systematically for the isoelectronic sequence, CH4, H3, H2O, so the atomic limit would be neon, 10 electrons all the time. And you see always the same effect, that's the kinetic energy of the light particles, the protons versus the heavy particles, the carbons or whatever the heavy particles are here. And you see at a certain intensity this ratio is really maximum, so it's a maximum difference. Only the protons get all the energy, the heavy ones stay behind. But this is relatively sharp and it happens at different intensities. And of course the question is, why is this really so sensitive to the intensity, this proton ejection? I mean, you must not hit it too hard, then you don't have the effect, and of course if you're too soft, you also don't see anything. And this is now what we really banged our head against for quite a while, but in the end it's relatively simple, and this is now demonstrated by a very simple model. So what you take is 10 to the 4 ions, homogeneously distributed over a sphere of radius r, and we propagate them for one picosecond. This is kind of all the photo ionized ions. And also the protons where the electrons have been removed because we take three quarters of these 10 to the four ions uh, being protons with a mass of the proton and one quarter like 20 times the proton mass, just simulating the heavy particle. Yeah? And then we see what happens. And what we do is we place n minus q electrons at random ions. So these are the electrons which are still left in the system. Yeah? And now you see what happens. You have three regions as a function of total charging, these two electrons, uh, which basically are removed. So this could, you could read as an intensity scale. Yeah? As higher the intensity is, as more electrons you remove out of the system, photo electrons. And then you see you have three regions. This region where nothing much happens in this ratio of separation of protons and heavy mm -hmm. particles. Then you have this region where you have this maximum separation, just what I showed you in the two calculation. And if you are too high in charging or in intensity, again, nothing much happens. So that really resembles what we just saw. So the simple model apparently accounts for the main effect. And then you can understand relatively, well, still not so easily, but we can understand what's actually happening. And this is tried to be visualized here. So this is a plot where the particles which could not explode are shown with the initial location within the sphere. So this is in the center, and this is more to the uh, basically uh, edge of our cluster. 
the radius is unity here. And the black line is what you would expect, where the electrons can screen all the ions, depending on how strong the system is charged. Yeah? If more and more electrons are removed, of course, a smaller and smaller part, a smaller and smaller sphere of the ions can be screened, because the electrons are gone. So this is what you would expect. And the light ions, uh, basically the protons, they are gone, more or less. This is what you expect. And they are actually gone even within the screening radius. And that's now what's new, because they are, have different masses. While the heavy ones, they stay. They stay even beyond the screening radius. This is what you would not expect. And the reason is simply that in this, this intensity interval, or global charging interval, that initially the protons start to move right from the beginning, even in the interior. And once they start to move, they cannot be screened effectively anymore. And that means you remove the, uh, the protons, but you have more electrons available because of the global charge balance for screening. And that is now for the benefit of the heavy ions, the carbon ions. So more of them are actually screened and stay behind where they were initially, as you would expect. And this gives you this large neutralization rate, or basically the fact that the heavy backbone of the ions, the carbon ions, really, really stay basically where they are and do not Coulomb explode. Here, of course, this is too violent. You lose too many charges, too many electrons. You don't have enough for screening. And here, only two or three uh, basically charges are created anyways. You see it here, so nothing happens. So that's the effect. And we think this is really a very general effect. And I think we saw traces of that really in Yoshi's and also Artem's talks for the molecule as well with the fast proton movement. But here, of course, you see it has very nice consequences for uh, coherent diffractive imaging because it really goes for the first time completely in the right direction since these protons take all the bad things which happen, the energy and the charge you create by photoionization. And you're not interested in the photons, which is the good news. And the good news is also that all these uh, biologically relevant molecules have lots of protons. <laughs> the, bad news, the bad news is, I should also say that, is that this is not for a relatively homogeneous system, yeah, because our methane or whatever it is.